pointer bugs are about 90% of the bugs in C++ code. I believe it. And it leads to some very unexpected, spectacular failures. So this is a case where you may compile your code, get a clean compile, <coughs> run it repeatedly, and it works perfectly every time, and then I go and grade it, and it crashes immediately without producing any useful output. How is this possible? Give me a scenario where this might happen. Ken? Uh, maybe computers? Bad. The computer's bad. No, let's assume the computers work. Yes? Is it because of the different outages? Between different the addresses. Yes, exactly. So, what happens if you run off the end of an array in C++? Well, we're going to talk about C++. We haven't yet. We're going to get there. But there are no array index out-of-bounds exceptions in C++. They don't exist. So if we have an array of size 10, and you do this, assuming it's called ARR, it's size 10, what happens? What happens if we do this assignment state, uh, statement with an array of size 10? It tries to add or send, uh, set equal to zero, whatever is one unit of size for the array after the end of the array? Yeah. So off the end of the array, that next chunk of memory you zero it out. Now, as long as that memory belongs to you, and it probably does, as long as it belongs to you, then it will work. When I say work, the assignment statement does not cause the program to crash and burn. There is no array index out of bounds exception. Rather, the assignment just goes ahead. So what would be the consequences of that? Well, you zeroed out something, but you don't know what it is. You don't know what it is. And if it's allocated on the heap and arrays are, there is no relationship between the location and memory and how you have declared variables. <coughs> so inside a method, when you declare variables, i.e. int x, y, z, the way it works is z gets allocated first, then y, then x, and they're on the stack, and they're in order, and they're right next to each other. That's just how it works. But arrays create two things, one thing on the stack and a very different thing on the heap. What are the two things allocated when we create an array in Java, let's say? You have a reference to the array, and then you have the array. You have two things, and they're different. So if we draw a picture here, we have the stack, and here we have ARR, and it holds an address. And over here we have the heap, and here on the heap <coughs> we have an array of size 10. That's where the array is. So this assignment statement. We'll put a zero right there. Well, who knows what's there? And so the result of this is it depends on what state the heap is in and how things have been allocated. But you may run this a hundred times with no problems and the hundred and first time you crash and burn. So obviously that's a problem, but it's far more insidious than that because it's not reproducible. This is a particularly nasty bug because you can't know what's going to happen. So you can't rely on testing to make sure that your code is error free. You may test it and have no issues. And then I test it and it falls apart. It's Murphy's Law, I guess. That seems to apply here. 
So it depends on what you zeroed out. I had this case years ago. I had students in 320, and they had written a C++ a plus plus program in my class. And the student came to see me, and he says, I cannot for the life of me figure this out. He had a for loop, and it hung in an infinite loop. And I'm looking, it's like for i equals 0. i less than 100, i plus plus. But it never stopped. <coughs> It makes no sense at all. So I looked at it and I agreed and we tested it and in fact do something. That's what the loop looked like. But the program hang, it was looping repeatedly. If I put a print statement in here, it would print it over and over and over and over and over again. So I thought, okay, let's print i and see what the values for i were. And it went 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, up to a certain point. And then it started at 0 again. So i was getting reset somehow inside that loop. It was a pointer bug. It was this scenario, this getting set to zero. Well, what was here? I was here. And in the middle of the loop, it gets reset to zero again. So it goes on and on, over and over and over and over, and it never stops. A particularly insidious bug and a difficult to find bug. So that is one of the problems that we have here with references and pointers is that we can get these unexpected side effects that occur, and they're extremely difficult to reproduce and <coughs> extremely difficult to track down. So doing things that are safe from the get-go is always a good idea. All right. So there's a little method, swap method. And then in our main method, we would say int x equals 2, y equals 4. Okay, so we declare two variables. And now we say swap x. Now I print them out, and what do I have for x? If I print x, system out print line, deviation. What prints? It's 50-50 chance. <laughs> what do you think? What is the value of x here after the swap? Four. Two. The value of x is two. What does the swap do? Nothing. It does nothing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It doesn't do anything. Does everybody see this? You guys are so quiet. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What happens? Okay, well, well let's, let's draw a picture of our stack here. So here's our stack. And of course, we use subroutines. We use the stack. So we call swap x and y. So we push things on the stack here. And the first thing on the stack is y, which is 4. And then x of 2. And then, you know, we'd have at some point the return address and so on. We enter the subroutine. And we swap x and y. And so we have 
Now instead of two and four, we have four and two. So far so good. And then we hit the close bracket, we exit the subroutine, and the stack is popped. It's now empty. And what did it do to x and y? And the answer is absolutely nothing. Absolutely nothing. So this doesn't do anything. How do we fix it? Yes? You can send pointers to it. Yes. Does that fix it? Does that fix it? Are we uncertain or bored? Uncertain. Uncertain. Okay. Yes, that fixes it. Why? What goes on the stack? On the stack goes the address of B of uh, Y and the address of X. So in the subroutine, this says go to where this points, the address of X, and read the value there and assign it to Ted. So Ted gets a gets B. Right, but what's getting swapped here? These guys aren't getting swapped now. They're addresses. What's getting swapped are these guys. So now we have 4 and 2. This is the difference between values by reference our subroutine parameters by reference versus by value. So again, it's the same idea. It's the pointer idea. If you pass in the address and you dereference it, then you permanently change variables in the calling program. But if you pass in copies, then you just swap the copies and it doesn't do anything. Does everybody follow? Okay. All right. We will hit this again next week when we start doing C++. So I will be sending you your class accounts and also uh, we'll be posting your first assignment. All right, we talked about that. How far did we get? Did we talk about the register? Or we got sidetracked talking about well, just a brief recap, you're responsible for this information. It's in the, in the text. So the SIC exit architecture, and it has a 20-bit address bus, which means max memory is equal to 1 megabyte, which is 2 twice, of course. Now the registers. We have B, S, C, 3, 4, and 5. And there's a floating point register, which we're just going to go ahead and forget about. And then we have the other registers from the first architecture. So these are added. S and T, S and T are general purpose registers just like A. Okay, so we have A, X, L, the PC, the status quo. So those are our set of registers. All right, so the B register is the base register. 
And what it provides is an addressing mode. So what we will have is, if we're using base addressing, it will be the displacement from the base location. We will see this as we go forward. The S and T are general purpose, the L is the link register, the X is indexed, and the A is the accumulator. Questions about these? Anyone? Okay, this may look really hard, but it's not. So there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight registers. We need to know what they are. Okay. So instruction formats. There are four of these. Yes, there's detail here. We're going to spend a lot of time on this this semester, so the, invest the time now to become, become familiar with it. So there's format one, and that is an 8-bit opcode. Format two is an 8-bit opcode. And then we have R1, R2. These are four bits each. So this is 16 bits total. The next one. Okay, we have these four formats we will be working with. Okay, so one is obvious, it's just the opcode. There are some opcodes that have no operands. So I've got my little sheet here, let me see if I can find one. So there's a bunch of them, well not a bunch, but there's some here. An example of this would be well, I just do this one. Okay, takes no operands. Takes no operands. Number two is register to register. So we would have something like and add R S T. Add what's in the S register to the T register, store the result in the T register. Number three, well, this is a memory reference. So we would do something like add alpha. Where alpha is a memory reference, it's a label. Okay, so one of the issues to talk about here, how do we encode a structure like add alpha? So what this says is, go to the memory location alpha, and starting at the memory location alpha, read three bytes, one word, and add it to the A register. So the contents of alpha go there, take the word size contents of alpha, and add it to register A, the accumulator. 
And of course, the A is hard coded. If you look, you guys all brought your sheet, right? So the mnemonic is add M, add space some memory location. So if you look at the effect, it says A gets what A points to, or what A reference, what A has in it, plus the memory location. So he is using the parentheses to indicate the contents at that place. The contents of A are added to m dot dot m plus 2. So that's three bytes. m, m plus 1, m plus 2. That's three bytes, one word, is added to the accumulator. Are you with me? You make, does this make sense? Questions? <coughs> it will get confusing soon, so if you have questions now, please ask. All right. So then the issue here, or what I want to focus on, is what are we going to do with this address of alpha? How do we encode it? So there are essentially two ways that this can be done. Either you can encode the actual physical address of alpha, or you can encode some kind of displacement. So remember, what is the program counter? The PC, what is that for? PC, what is it? Not personal computers. Program counter, what is the program counter? Yes? That's the address of the next execute. It's got the address of the next instruction to execute. So, just assuming for a minute we have no flow control, i.e. loops or branches, but just instructions. You start at the first one, and you sequentially march through your code till you get to the end. So the PC always has the address of the next instruction to execute. Now then, is it possible, if you know what is in the program counter, to calculate the distance from the program counter Alpha. So imagine, let me draw a picture. We have this scenario. Okay, we have this scenario. Here's our program in memory. And this is alpha, this memory. And the PC is right here. We can look in the register, we can see the PC. Is it possible to know precisely how many bytes there are from here to here? Is it possible? The answer is yes, it's not only possible, but it's easy. Everything has an address. The way the assembler works is it starts out at some starting address. And it generates addresses of everything. That's the first pass. They're usually two pass assemblers. It is the first pass. It goes through and assigns an address for everything. So if the addresses are known, if the addresses are known, this becomes easy. This becomes easy. You can say alpha is n bytes away from where we're at right now. So this is PC relative mode, and there is a displacement that is encoded. So it will be something like we will add the contents of memory in bytes from where we're at right now. It's either that or the hard-coded address, which is more difficult. All right. So this seems kind of shaky to you guys, and I get that. I want to do an exercise, and maybe this will help. Some of the topics in this exercise we haven't gotten to yet, but we will direct them. So we're going to do an exercise. 
We're going to assemble some code. You probably need to redistribute in the back, I'm not counting. There should be enough of these. So this is what this architecture's machine code looks like. Okay. So we have the line number, we have the address, we have a label if it exists, and the opt code, which is the instruction, and the operand, what it operates on. So, everybody have one? Yes? Okay. So I do hope you also have your instructions. We will refer to these all semester. Uh, so, the very first line of executable code is 6. So we're going to skip right now the EQU statements on 4 and 5. That just sets those symbols uh, manually. So base is also, so I'm going to change what I said. It is line seven is the first executable instruction. So if you look on your chart here, you will not find an instruction called start. There is not one. Nor is there an instruction called EQU. That's designed, it's an assembler directive. It tells the assembler that these symbols, the SRCH, OFFB, they're equal to a certain value. And the base is a directive as well. So our first executable instruction is LDV. Does everybody see that on line seven? Mm -hmm. So LDV is on the chart. It's the first one that is. And we're starting at address zero. So what's the address of LDV? Pound sign zero is zero. So line seven has address zero. What is the address of line 8? Okay, LDV. If we look in the chart for LDV, we will see that it takes 3 or 4, and so it takes 3. The ones with the plus in front of them take 4. So again, we're jumping ahead a little so we can get this idea. Okay, so if LDV takes 3, then LDS is 3 bytes away. So the address for line 8 is 3. And then the address of line 9, we have LDS, and LDS is also a 3, 4, so it's 6. Now then, at line 9, at address 6, we have plus LDX, so the plus there indicates that it's format 4, not format 3. It's format 4, so it's 4 bytes. It's 4 bytes, it's got a plus in front of it. Okay, so what's the address of line 10? A. A. And line 11? E. Now, where'd these letters come from? What's this A and this E? X. They're hexadecimal, right? Right. We don't use decimal for anything really in the computer, and certainly not for addresses. So the A is 10, the E is 14, but I would expect you to be able to convert hex numbers. Familiar with that. All right. At line 11, we have add, and it takes three. So line 12 is what address? One, one. Yes, 17. And then we have LDX and that's three, one, four. 
You see this? Okay, so if we're ready to execute the plus LDT instruction on line 13, then the PC has 00014 in it. But if we go this way, pretty soon we're going to get to alpha, so let's keep going. So, on line 14, line 13, we have a plus LDT, that's 4, so it's 0018. And then we have LDX, that's 3, 0, 0, 1, B. And at 16, it is 1B plus 3, which is what? Eleven and three. Eleven and three. One E. And at one E we have add, which is three. So we have zero, zero, what? Two, one. And then we have four plus JLT. Zero, zero, two, five. And then we have JLT, so it's two, five, plus three, two, eight. And then we have R sub. How many does R sub take? Three. Okay, so that would be zero, zero, two, B, correct? Everybody with me? We have 002B on line 20. Have I lost anyone? What we're doing is how big are these instructions? How much room do they take up? So I'm going to halt for just a second and draw another picture. I find these helpful. I hope you do too. We've got this block of memory. This starts at address zero. So the very first thing we have is this LDB. LDB pound sign delta. Delta. And that's three bytes. So here is address three. And this is LDS. 100, and here at 6, we have plus LDX at beta, and here is A, so it marches down in memory just like this. Yes? Um, where is it that our sub has to be a few bytes? Plus, 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 plus. It doesn't have any arguments. However, it's still format 3. So if you look at R sub on this sheet, the instruction sheet, R sub format, and the format on R sub is 3 4. So of course there's no argument, so it's going to be 3. Okay. What is the address of line 22? Alpha. What's the address of alpha? To be. There's no executable instructions here, so it's to be. Okay, can we? So let's assume, I don't know, I'm just going to pick one. Let's say we're on, I don't know, line 14. Let's just say we're on line 14. That's what we're going to execute next. So the PC has 0018. So addresses, of course, are 20 bits, and that's five hex digits, hence the five digits I have written down. Okay, that's where we're at right now.
Can I calculate the distance to alpha? Yes? 11 minus 8. So, alpha is 19 bytes away. Does everybody see this? 1, 3, of course, is 16 plus 3. It's hexadecimal. So, alpha is 19 bytes away, assuming that we're on, that we're ready for line 14. Does everybody see this? Are we okay? All right, so you have two choices. You can either encode 1, 3, or you can encode the full address of alpha, 0002B. Well, addresses are 20 bits, and if any of the combinations are possible, you have to use that space. So, it's wasteful to hard code the full address. It's wasteful because it takes more space than you really need. It's pretty easy to say, from where we're at right now, go forwards 19 bytes and read the contents of memory at that location. So, Every line of code here, if we continued on, would have an address. Every line of code would have an address. Every instruction, every storage allocation directive, everything here has an address. What that means then is we have positional relationship between entries. Now, some of you look like I've lost you. Have I lost you? Good. Okay, suppose we have and now I want to set y to two. Can I do it using x? We're talking about Java here. I want to set the value of y to two. So I'm going to say x equals what? How is that going to fix y? Can I set y using x? I could set x to 2, but I want to set y. I don't want to set x. Is there a way I can set y using x? No. Yes? No, no, I'm not going to say x. There's no x. I can't use x in the assignment statement. Or y, I'm sorry. I can't put y in the statement. I'm only going to use x to set y. Yes? Are the addresses next to each other? You don't know that. You can't know that. So the answer, of course, is no, you can't. It's not possible. I'm going to set y using x. You can't. It's not possible. What can I put here? It's going to change y. Now, if I could say x equal y equal 2, okay, that would set y, but I've got y equals 2. I want to set y, but not refer to it, just use x. Huh. Okay, so. This is a bad example, this one we're looking at here, but assume that we have another sheet with alpha and beta. Suppose I have this arrangement. Alpha. And alpha is a word. And let's say it has two in it. And beta is a word that has three in it. Okay, so we have allocated these. Now let's assume, well, we had 2B, we'll use it. The address of alpha is 2B. Do we know what the address of beta would be? Yes, a word is 3 bytes. We know how big it is. So 11 and 3? Eleven and 
3 to 14, right? Is everybody <coughs> with me? Okay, can I change beta using alpha? Yes, I can change alpha plus 3, and what is that? That's beta. That's beta. So we look at the memory map here. This spot right here is 2b, and this is alpha. Alpha plus 1 plus 2, alpha plus 3. Alpha plus 3, go there and put whatever you want. Can we change beta using alpha? We can. In the set where we can. Well, why? Alpha and beta are both variables. X and Y in the Java example, those are variables. Where are they? You don't know where they are. You don't know. Variables will get you three things. What is it? An integer, a string, a float. What is it? Where is it and what size is it? Those are properties of variables. I say int x. Okay, what is it? It's an integer. Where is it? Well, we don't know and we don't care, but the machine knows. The compiler knows. How big is it? It's 32 bits in size. Well, in the assembler realm, you have to handle all those things yourself. What we have are labels, which are nothing more than addresses, and that's all they are. Therefore, you can use one address to get to anything else you want to. It's fairly common with assembly language programs to have a storage allocation section where you allocate labels. And again, this should not seem unfamiliar to you guys that have had 237 or the top equivalent. You can allocate storage for user-defined data. And I use alpha beta, but those names aren't significant. But what a lot of people do is this. It's not the best, but hell, it's a similar, why not? Word two. Word four. Byte six. Word. Eight. Okay, how do I get to the word that has eight in it? Well, this is data plus three, and this is data plus six, and this is data plus seven. This is data plus seven. Is that legal? Of course it is. Do you need labels for each of those? No, you don't. All right, so the point I want to make here is in a program like this, in an assembly language program like this, every instruction, every chunk of memory has an address, and all of them have a positional relationship with every other piece. Could we calculate the distance from the start of the program to out? Well, since the program started at zero, we already got it. It's 2B away from the start of the program. You follow me? So the big picture idea here we want to get is that if we hard code the physical address of alpha, it's wasteful. But if instead I can find a way to encode the distance from a fixed or known point, that's cheaper. So for format 3, we will never encode the actual address because there aren't enough bits there. There are 12 bits, and that's it. There are 12 bits, not 20. Again, this saves space. There's another issue here. Most programs are relocatable. What does that mean, relocatable? It means that at the time you're going to load and run the program, 
It can go anywhere in memory. You know, if you're hard coding an address, what are the chances you're going to get it? Imagine we have a thousand people using Rohan or Edoras. And you pick address 3000, what are the chances you're going to get address 3000? Well, somebody else is probably using that address. That's not how it works. We don't want to hard code addresses. So zero is kind of code word for a relocatable program. So, okay, here's how it works. You want to run your program, and it starts at address zero. So you tell the operating system, I want to start this program up and run it. Where does it go in memory? And the operating system looks for a place where it will fit and returns a starting address. So, okay, let's say that the operating system returns a starting address. And so, rather than address zero, start at zero, the OS returns to A or Z reset. Okay, that's our new starting address. So the address of all of these instructions, of course, will change, and that's not a problem if nothing in them has to be changed. So, let's take an, ad, an instruction like this. Does that need to be modified in any way? No. Nothing about that changes. What you're encoding here is that it's an add and the S and the T. Does it matter where it goes in memory? No, it does not. This is not doesn't require any modifications. However, what about this? Oh dear, it's not a 2B anymore. It's not a 2B. Where is it? <coughs> no. 11 and 6. 11 and 6, and 17, 1, carry 1, 6, and That's where output is. So you can't, actually, yeah, if this is your starting address, this is where output is. Okay, so what you will have to do is every memory reference must be changed in the entire program. So if you have a lot of memory locations, and in fact most of the instructions have memory references, if that's the case, then when you load the program, you're going to have to fix these addresses somehow. There are different ways that this is done. One of them is having the linker loader go through as you're loading the program and change every single memory reference. So if you have a large program and you have thousands of memory references, you'll have thousands of modifications to the executable, the simple code that you'll have to make. The other way this is done is with the memory management unit. There's a chip in some systems, and it intercepts every request <coughs> or memory and adds to it to get the actual runtime address where it happens to be in memory. So those are the two most commonly used methods. But imagine that we have thousands of lines of code and thousands of memory references, but all of them use displacements instead of actual addresses. What do we have to change if we load them into different types of memory? Nothing. Nothing. So if a given location is n bytes away from another part of the program, it's always that distance. So we were using line 14 as an example, and the distance between 1.8 and 2b doesn't change if we change the actual location. The displacement remains constant. You follow me? Because there's a positional relationship between everything 
So this is an important mode, and that's what these flags are. So there are two offset-related addressing modes. And the one I've been talking about is P, PC relative. So you use a 1 in this field, and it says use what's encoded in the instruction as the distance from the program counter to the memory you want to read. The other one is the base. And the way this works is you load an address into the base register, and then the displacement or offset is from the address in the base register. So the reason this becomes important, imagine this scenario. I have my code here, and underneath I have storage allocation. So I have maybe an alpha. And here I have 1,000 bytes. And I have beta. And I have 4,000 bytes. And then I have gamma. And it's 4 bytes. And then I have delta. Delta. And it's 1 byte. Okay, what's the distance from some unknown PC to delta? Well, what's the distance right here? This is 5,004 bytes. Okay, is that going to work? We have 12 bits for the displacement, and it can be forward or backward. We need backward references. Like if you have a branch and you got to go back up to the start of a program or a loop where you have to go back, you have to have backward references. So, signed numbers with 12 bits, what are the range of possible values? The possible values you can encode with 12 bits. Bothers me, you guys are so quiet. What's two to the twelve? What's two to the twelve? Now, if you can't answer that question, shame on you. Forty ninety-six. Right. Well, you know, you can always count if you find yourself stuck. Right, two to the first is two, four, eight, sixteen, thirty-two, sixty-four, one twenty-eight, two fifty-six, five twelve, ten twenty-four. Okay, can you multiply ten twenty-four times two? Twenty forty-eight. Forty ninety-six. Can you, I mean this is not rocket science? Two to the twelfth is forty ninety-six. But if half the numbers are negative and half are positive. What are the range of possible values? The range of possible values is minus 2048 plus. That's the range of values. So it's 2 to the 11. <coughs> 2 to the 11. Now, why is there one more over here than there is over here? Because zero is a number, zero counts. Zero up to 2047 is 2048 numbers. So this is minus 2048 to minus 1. This is zero to 2047. So you can say zero is a positive number. Or if that bothers you, you can say we partition them into negative and non-negative. I think everyone agrees that zero is a non-negative number. But this is the range of values. So the question then becomes, will this work? No, it's too big. It won't work. You're up here someplace in the code. <coughs> and 
you look in the program counter, you get an address, and the displacement down to delta is too big to fit. So there is another method, and that is the base relative mode. And in fact, this sheet here, the first instruction you see is LDB pound sign delta. Load the address of delta into the base register. Well, with this scenario, I'd load gamma. I would load the address of gamma in the base register, and now I can use the base register as my displacement point. How far away is delta? What is the distance from gamma to delta? Four bytes. Now, what about this one? Irrelevant. Everybody gets that, right? Let me draw another picture. I like my pictures. We have far away is delta from gamma. This is gamma. Gamma plus one. Gamma plus two. Gamma plus three. This is gamma plus four. Does everybody see that? Okay, if I use the base mode then, in those 12 bits I can put four. Certainly. So there are two ways to get around the problem of storing the hard-coded address. One is to use the program counter, where we're at right now to where we want to read how far is it. And the other is to set a fixed reference point and put it in the base of the register. Questions? So if you have not read through chapter one in the text carefully, really should do that over the weekend period. It's tough going. It's dense. There's like three words that are super important and carry lots. I mean, every bit of it needs to be there. Right? The department chairman wrote that book. And he's a brilliant guy. But he's big on precision. Few words with absolute precision. And every single sentence in that is important. So go through it and read it carefully. I know it's dense and it's hard to follow, but keep at it. You will have to do it if you want to make it to this class. There's some good news here. Once you get your arms around it, it's not so bad. It's pretty obvious and easy, but it also gives you deep insight of what's going on inside the computer system. And that's really what we're after here. Concepts, you, many of them, you brushed on them before and you've never really taken deep looks. And now we're taking a deep look at what happens inside the machine at lower levels when we are starting up and running programs. So that's the goal. If it seems overwhelming a little bit, I'm not shocked or surprised. I know that. When I first started on this, I felt that way too. I remember first time they asked me to teach this course, and I read through that book, and I'm thinking, oh my goodness, uh, this is going to be difficult. And then I read it again, and, oh. and I read it again, and I thought, ah, okay, okay, I see. And we just need to hang on until we get to the okay, I see moments. I mean, computer science is all about that. I remember years ago, I have to tell you a story on myself. I was taking 5.6, and I had Professor Boss, who wrote one of the texts that's commonly used in 5.60. She's still a very dear friend of mine. Uh, and I said, you know, Sarah, I read this very carefully, and it didn't make any sense to me. And I read it again, and it still didn't make any sense to me. And I probably read that five or six times before I began to even start to get it. And I must have gone through that ten times before it really made any sense. What is wrong with me? 
no, am I doing this wrong? What's the deal? She said, Alan, we all do that. So that's how it works. That's how you learn. This is technical, complex material. And you go through it, and you don't get it, and you go through it again, and you don't get it. You go through it again, and you go, okay, I got a little piece. And you go through it again, and you get more. And you just keep at it until you get it. That's the process. This woman has a PhD from Berkeley. She's brilliant. And she told me that's what she does. So then I felt that. So if it feeds, feels like it's really overwhelming, trust me, this is not 560. It is not 560. This is accessible, but it takes a little effort. So we will continue talking about this material going forward. And again, this is an integral part. This architecture is an integral part of what we will be doing this semester. And I will ask you to do hand translations. So we did one part. We put the addresses down. We're going to come back and hand code each of those instructions. And you're going to have that on a test. So you will have to get your arms around how this works, not understand it some general way but own it. All right, I've got another handout to give you. And I'll talk a little bit about it. I want you to study it over the weekend, and we will revisit on Monday. These are allowed addressing modes. Remember what addressing modes are. How do you get to it? Well, there are more addressing modes in C and C++ than there are in Java. They've eliminated those to make the language simpler. Um, but we want the power of a language like C++. With that comes a little more complexity. <coughs> So these are the various addressing modes, and I'm going to run through them just quickly. I want you to be able to explain them, understand what's going on. Everybody got their hands on one now? Okay, I want to talk about how this works. So I'm going to skip the shaded section at the top. These are more unusual. That is, the fact that something's legal doesn't mean it's a good idea. So for instance, add alpha. Well, yeah, that makes sense. But does this. legal, what this says is, go to address 2, and starting at address 2, read three bytes, and add the contents of those three bytes to register A. Well, what's in memory at address 2? Well, who knows? Right, so that's almost certainly an error, but it's legal. So the grayed out section are things that are legal but questionable. The white section, the white background, these are the part and, par part and parcel of what you need to know. So running down the first one, LDA alpha. Notice there's two LDA alphas. The first one is base mode, and the second one is PC relative mode. Those are the modes. So it means dereferenced. In both cases, it's the contents in memory located at alpha. Then we have plus LDA, and in this case it's format 4, and the full 20-bit instruction is encoded in it. Now we have LDA alpha comma X. So this mode is go to the address alpha plus whatever's in the X register, go there, and read the contents of memory. Okay, the next one. So the first one is base and then PC relative, two ways to encode the same thing. So again, this is kind of the mode you would use for arrays. It is alpha, the address of alpha, plus whatever is in the X register. Add that together, go there, and read that spot in memory. So LDA alpha plus X, essentially. 
And so there are three of those. There are three of each of these. PC relative, base relative, and then format for the full address. Now, LDA at alpha. So this is the contents in memory located at alpha is an address. Go to that, that address. So this is a chain of dereferences. Go to alpha and read what you find there as an address and go there and read what you find in memory. So these are pointer variables. These are like pointer variables. If I have a pointer, and everybody understands a pointer or a reference, we've talked about this. If I have a pointer or a reference, <coughs> I have person P, all right? This is P. Well, what's in memory here? It's an address. Okay, it matches, mimics this scenario. The other scenario is this, alpha. Okay, so that's LDA alpha. Go to alpha and load the contents of memory at alpha in the register. Go grab the two. The add sign. Go to P, and at P there's an address. Go to that address and grab what you find there. So then over here on the heap is the actual person object. And this points to that. Yes? So is that equivalent to like two star in C? It's equivalent to one star in C. It's equivalent to one star in C. It says, go there and be referenced. But it's, a, it's not a variable, it's a memory location, but at that memory location is an address, so it's this scenario, as opposed to this one. Everybody follow me? Okay. So that's what the at sign is. Read what you find in alpha as an address and go there. And then we have pound sign alpha, and that means the address, not the content. LDA pound sign alpha means load the 24-bit address of alpha in the register. These are addressing nodes. So the first one we have, LDA alpha. There's three versions. This is go to alpha, read what you find there, and put it in and register A. Load what's in memory at location alpha into register A. Alpha comma X. Load what you find in memory, and alpha plus x, go there. But x is an offset, so it's alpha plus x. Go there, take what you find in memory, put it in register A. The LDA means load. Load into register A. The at. Go to address alpha, and then read the address at address alpha, and go there and load what you find in memory into A. And then finally, load the address of alpha into A. Yes? This is A, isn't it? Yes. So, these are, there's one, two, three, four main addressing modes that you have here. Questions about this? Okay, so hang on to these. Uh, handouts. I don't want to reprint them too many times. Let's say the trees. I will try to have some spares if you need, but bring them with you. That way you don't have to bring the textbook. And we will continue working.